five, four, three, two, one. Hey, Shagheads, Curtis Tucker here with another episode of a Shaggy Life podcast. I am back from the big eclipse, and that's what uh, today's episode is all about. So I've got uh, basically just going to tell you kind of the story of what happened and how it was, a little bit of how it compared to the 2017 eclipse and all that stuff. But I appreciate you guys checking in on the podcast. If you guys are listening to the podcast, don't forget that I do video it. And if you watch the video, I'm waving at you right now. You can see that at youtube.com slash Curtis Tucker. Just search for Curtis Tucker uh, in YouTube and subscribe to that. Subscribe to the podcast so you guys know when I upload new episodes and I am uh, going to try very, very hard to continue to keep this updated every week with uh, just kind of random stuff for a while. But um, I think that's... Uh, I've got two emails if you guys need to contact me. I've got shags at shaggyduck.com or curtis at curtistucker.com. So uh, get a hold of me at one of those if you guys uh, need to contact me. If you guys would like to be on the podcast, um, if you've got a really interesting subject that kind of fits into anything I've got going on, I would love to have you on the show. So hit me up um, for that and everything. And uh, I think that's, I can't really think of anything else. So don't, and then don't forget that not only uh, do we have this podcast and the video, but then I also have a blog post where I kind of type out what happened on curtistucker.com. And then at the bottom of curtistucker.com, that that blog post, um, I embed this podcast and the video so you can actually get all three on one page uh, if you want to. So go to curtistucker.com, check out all the other old episodes on all kinds of fun stuff. So... Um, Monday was the 2024 uh, eclipse with the uh, totality going over, uh, basically crossing the entire country. So each time there's an eclipse that covers, that goes basically all the way across the country, it's a big deal. And it's been like 99 years since we had had one before 2017. And then we had the one in 2017. And then just by sheer planetary alignment, we have this one, which was only seven years later. So that's pretty rare to have those two happen. And um, I wasn't quite aware in 2017 how rare all that was. I thought I was just um, not paying attention to eclipses, but come to find out there just weren't any, and that's why there wasn't a lot of um, talk about it. So what happened was... Uh, we had the 2017 eclipse, which w- kind of went north and south across the United States. Um, no, it went east and west. Well, it went from, I believe, 2017 went from west to east, but it went that direction, and it went over um, Fairmont, Nebraska, which is where Todd and I uh, drove up to, slept in a park, and did. it was a completely total a spur of the moment deal, didn't even pack any clothes. We just drove up there, slept in a park, watched the eclipse at totality right on the center line, and then drove back immediately. So wasn't a lot of planning. Um, I basically found out where the eclipse was going to be crossing Highway 81, which goes out of Enid, and it went right, it went, uh, right over an area called Fairmont, Nebraska. I got online. They had a Facebook page inviting people to come sleep in the park. So it was kind of a no-brainer. We went up there for that. It was a rather short eclipse. Um, On the center line, totality was only about two and a half minutes. Again, just kind of, I was kind of unaware of all this eclipse stuff. I, at that time, had no idea uh, that there were people that were eclipse chasers. Had no idea. But once we got there and started interviewing people, um, we met two guys that had hopped on an airplane from London and on the spur of the moment, ended up in Fairmont, Nebraska, and uh, they were basically chasing the eclipse, and then there was lots of other people. So, of course, after that experience, which is an uh, awe-inspiring, cosmic, core, once-in-a-lifetime type event, me and probably a million other people started talking about it in 2017 about how cool it was. And then everybody that did not go to the eclipse in 2017 
thought, oh, wow, it's only seven years away to 2024. I'm going to plan on going to that one. Well, the 2024 eclipse is went from south to north across the whole United States. Well, it covered a lot of really populated areas, so a lot of people didn't even have to chase. They just literally walked out their front door. The whole kind of Dallas area and then all the way up, I believe, uh, to Maine um, had uh, totality. And so so this is kind of um, the story of uh, kind of what happened on this adventure, trying to uh, get in the path of totality for the 2024 um, eclipse. So come to find out, not only are there eclipse chasers, but they have a name for them, and they are called Umbra Files. And an Umbra File uh, means a shadow lover. So if you are a lover of chasing the shadow of the moon, you are called an Umbra File. And if you spend your time and your money chasing the next eclipse, you are considered an eclipse chaser. So I was an eclipse virgin in 2017. And now that I have chased my second eclipse, spent money, spent time, um, getting to the 2024 eclipse, I can officially say I am an amateur uh, eclipse chaser. I would think that by my third one, I could maybe be considered... I think if I left the country for one eclipse, I could probably call myself a professional eclipse chaser. But right now, uh, just put me down as a amateur uh, eclipse chaser. So this time, basically... Um, Basically, in 2017, I had planned on on seeing the 2024. So about a year ago, I started planning on the 2024 and telling people they needed to take off work and, and get ready for it. Well, it was kind of a no-brainer because the 2024 eclipse was going over Grapevine, Texas, which is where our buddy Staten, my best friend, live. So I thought, well, that'll be easy. We'll just drive down to Grapevine, Texas and stay at his house. And my, my thought was, and I don't know why exactly, but I guess because it's when you're when there's an eclipse, there's a center line, and then there's kind of the same amount of space on both sides of the line within a distance, and that's where totality is. That's where when the, the moon completely blocks out the sun and it gets dark, and the closer you are to that center line, the longer the eclipse lasts. So a lot of people try to get to the center line because that's um, the most length of the darkness. And when you're uh, going to see an eclipse that's only two and a half minutes long at its longest, you want to be at the center. Whereas 2024, um, you know, we could have been at the very edge of totality and it would have been two and a half minutes towards the center, it was over four and a half minutes of totality. And so um, so when I was looking about going down to Grapevine, I was looking at different towns, and the, the town that seemed the best choice and the closest to the center was Terrell, Texas. So originally, I was thinking about going down to Grapevine, staying with my buddy, and then us loading up and going over to Terrell, Texas, being really close to, um, to the center of totality and watching it there. And so that was kind of the plan. And then uh, as we got closer, uh, Denise, I told Denise, you know, to take off work. So it was going to be Todd, Denise, and I were going to drive down and stay with Staten and then... Um, hang out down there. And uh, we were planning on going on either Saturday night or very early Sunday morning uh, to get there by lunch so we could hang out. And then the eclipse was on Monday afternoon. So uh, as we got closer, uh, basically what you do if you're an eclipse chaser is you start looking at the weather. Um, you want to make sure kind of what what the what they for our forecasting, even though it may not be correct, but at least you kind of get an idea. And unfortunately, about two weeks out, they started talking about um, a weather system coming into the um, Texas area during the eclipse. So that started getting us a little bit worried. And um, one of the things that I started worrying about was just the overall population in Dallas, and then all of the people that were outside 
of the zone of totality driving into the zone of totality around Dallas, making it even more crowded and packed. And so I kind of started getting worried about, you know, how early we would have to leave to go over ter- to Terrell, Texas, and then would we get stuck for hours in Terrell, Texas after the eclipse trying to get out. Um, so started worrying about that a little bit and then also started worrying about the cloud cover um, that was going to be over the Dallas area. And then about one week before the eclipse, there were dozens of articles and interviews with local authorities. Uh, and I don't know why, I don't remember this from the 2017 eclipse. I think it was because we hadn't had one in so long. Nobody knew what was going to happen. But a lot of towns got flooded with people uh, to see the eclipse. And so they wanted to be prepared for 2024. So authorities started talking about letting kids out of school, basically to watch the eclipse and to have National Guard and have extra supplies. And that wasn't because something weird was going to happen. It was to control the traffic. And if there was a gas station, you know, they wanted them to have extra snacks and drinks and gas. And they just didn't want a huge amount of traffic flooding some of these towns and and running the town out of supply. So that's where all of that concern came in, which again, I don't remember any of that really being talked about in 2017. But they, they were expecting, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in certain towns um, and tens of thousands to head over kind of towards the um, Terrell, Texas area. And so uh, as we were getting closer, you know, a week out, I was starting to have some reservations about the whole um, Dallas thing. And then one day it kind of dawned on me that, hey, you know, I, I was looking on the, there's all these cool eclipse maps that you can literally click on anywhere in the world and it will tell you when the eclipse is going to happen and how long it's going to last wherever you click. So I clicked on, clicked on Grapevine and I think they had um, two and a half minutes of totality there, which would have equaled what I had in 2017. So I got to thinking, well, you know, you know, heck, we could just go to Grapevine, stay there, miss out on two minutes of totality, but we wouldn't have to fight the traffic. We wouldn't have to worry about getting stuck in Terrell, Texas for hours and all that. And we'd be able to hang with our friends and grapevines. So I kind of started leaning towards that of maybe just staying uh, in grapevine. But as we got even closer, um, about four days before the eclipse, the weather really was looking bad for Texas. And not only were they talking about Uh, cloud cover, but then they started talking about storms and rain. And if you've got thick rain clouds, um, it is going to get dark and maybe even darker than normal for an eclipse, but you're just not going to be able to see the actual eclipse, which the cool thing about being in totality is as soon as totality starts, you have the ability to look up at the sun and see the moon blocking it out, and you can you can look at it um, without glasses on. And you can also, I have a Canon camera. You can point the camera with a zoom lens right at the moon and take pictures, and it doesn't harm your camera. And so, um, if it was going to be, you know, covered with clouds, that was not going to be possible. And so, I was not too thrilled about that, but I decided to kind of play it by ear and see what happened. But um, I thought now, of course, you know, four days out, you are almost too late to be able to book any rooms in a lot of these um, totality towns. But I started thinking, well, if we don't go to Texas, you know, what are we going to do? Well, the really the only alternative uh, as far as like driving, you know, within a short period of time was Arkansas. And so it looked like the clouds were going to be building up from the Gulf and from some storms coming across Mexico, and they were going to be converging on Texas. And it kind of looked like on the forecast that the clouds were not going to build up until up to Arkansas before the eclipse. So it looked like Arkansas possibly was going to be clear. And so I started thinking that it might be a better idea to head towards Arkansas. And um, then we got to about um, three days before the eclipse. So eclipse was on Monday. So now we're talking like Friday 
um, I started looking at rooms if we decided to go to Arkansas. And so one of the towns, and so Arkansas, basically the easiest way for us to, to go would have been dry to drive east on 412 and go to Fayetteville, which is where we go all the time because our daughter's going to the University of Arkansas. So we're used to going to Fayetteville. And then I figured that's a three and a half hour drive. And then from Fayetteville, we could go, Fayetteville was not in the zone of totality. So we would have to drive at least another hour to get into totality. So I started looking at towns up there and that's in the Northern part of Arkansas. And it's just, there's just not a lot of clear straight highways up there. It's, it's these little two lane winding roads. And so then I started worrying about getting caught in traffic in the mountains and getting stuck during totality being on a road with trees and not being able to see it. But there was a highway, um, highway 49 South of Fayetteville went down to I 40. And then at I 40, it's all, you know, four lane fast highway. We could catch some towns on I 40. And so there was Ozark and Clarksville and Russellville. And those were getting closer and closer to the center of totality. And again, the closer you get to the center, of course, you get more time of totality, but you also run into way more traffic. And so I kind of kind of started thinking about Ozark or Clarksville um, because they would be fairly quick to get to because of the major highways, but not so far in that maybe they wouldn't have as many Uh, as much traffic. And so I started looking at rooms at Clarksville and actually was surprised that three days before the event, there were some rooms available in some of their hotels, but um, prices were triple what they normally were. And there was actually one hotel that had rooms for a thousand dollars a night for a Monday night. And then some of the rooms had a two night minimum. So um, decided was not going to stay in Clarksville if we headed to Arkansas. Um, Then I checked on some rooms in Fayetteville and found out that the rooms in Fayetteville, especially at the hotels that we like to stay at for Arkansas football games, they were regular price. And so I actually, so then Saturday morning before the eclipse, woke up, checked the weather again, still not looking good for Texas. Checked on rooms in Fayetteville at The Graduate, the hotel that we like to stay at. They had rooms available at regular price. So I called um, Staten, or I think Staten ended up calling me right as I was going to call him. We talked about um, the grapevine trip and the weather going down there, and he agreed with me that it might be better uh, if we headed towards um, Arkansas, you know, since we were wanting to kind of re-experience it and get photographs and do video and all of that. So uh, basically we changed our entire plan from going to Texas and uh, switched to going to Arkansas. So I got online and booked uh, two rooms at the Graduate in Fayetteville for Sunday night. And then that meant that we didn't have to leave as early So we're planning on leaving early Sunday to go to Grapevine to hang out. Well, since we didn't really need to hang out, we left later on Sunday, loaded up, um, and drove to Fayetteville. Uh, Got to Fayetteville and um, had dinner. And on the drive over, I told Todd and Denise to kind of look at Clarksville and Jasper and Ozark and see, you know, what was going on, which of those three towns we might want to go to. Now, the thing about Jasper is it was basically due east of Fayetteville, um, not deep into totality, but we could have gotten to at a shorter distance. But again, it was in the windy, it was a really small town, and they didn't really have anything listed as a big event going on. But um, I thought that because it was further north, if there were clouds in Arkansas, there might be fewer clouds in Jasper. So that's why it was on the list. But again, it was in the the mountain area where it would have been two lane, really windy roads. And so I wasn't super enthused about going there. Um, Ozark was not real far over the Oklahoma border. Um, because it wasn't closer to the center of totality, I figured 
there wouldn't be as many people there and we could get out of there a lot quicker after the eclipse. They did have a big event going on in their downtown, um, lots of things uh, going on there. So that was a possibility. Clarksville um, seemed like a good sized town, uh, seemed like a great in between place to go. They had like three, I think three and a half minutes of totality there. And then um, Denise brought up Russellville, which was even further east, closer to the center of totality. They had some things going on, I think a slightly bigger town than Clarksville. And so we kind of put that on the list. And uh, when we were eating, we stopped and ate at a place called Feed and Folly in Fayetteville Sunday night and got to talking to our bartender, and she was asking us, you know, what we were up to, and we told her we were there for the eclipse, and I asked her, you know, where where would be a good place to go? Where have you heard? And so she kind of thought about it, and um, she said, well, where were you thinking about going? And I told her Jasper, Clarksville, um, possibly Russellville, and she said, oh, don't go to Russellville. It's uh, not that big of a town and um, it'll be super duper crowded because it was closer to um, the center. And I said, oh, okay, well, let's let's don't go there then. So maybe Clarksville. And so she kind of did some research on the roads to Clarksville and everything. And so she basically thought Clarksville would be our best bet. So we didn't have to go through the mountains. We had four-lane highway all the way, um, a decent amount of um, totality. And so at that point, that was kind of our plan was to get up, and drive to Clarksville and watch the eclipse there. We also had a buddy from the Fayetteville area that is one of our regular listeners on our 70s Buzz podcast that lives there. He was going to go to Clarksville and watch the eclipse. So I thought, well, if somebody from Arkansas is heading to Clarksville, then that's got to be a a fairly good location to see the eclipse. Plus, we thought if we went there, we could meet him, and it would be fun to meet one of our listeners. So the plan was to get up and go to Clarksville. Now, the um, second part of that was how early did we want to get up. And so in the meantime, another guy that we knew from Enid, a, a guy that Todd and I had actually graduated high school with, he texted me and asked where we were going because he knew we were going to go eclipse chasing. And I told, I had told him earlier we were going to Grapevine, but then I told him we were probably going to head towards Clarksville, Arkansas. So he said that he was heading to Clarksville, which I think he decided to go there because we were going there and he was going to drive over there Sunday night and sleep in his Suburban. And so that's what he did. He drove over to Clarksville, slept in his Suburban in a Love's parking lot. And um, so we uh, went to bed. Well, before we went to bed, we uh, made a dis- we went to the bar at uh, the graduate and, st- and started thinking about, you know, what the plan was. Well, with all of the, I hate to say fear mongering, but the, the worrying that the municipalities were saying about, you know, stock up on gas, stock up on supplies, make sure you have water, make sure, you know, there's going to be a National Guard out, blah, blah, blah. I got worried that there would be an influx of like a million people in the morning heading to Clarksville. We might get stuck in traffic and not get there on time. Um, but we didn't, we decided that we wanted to try to eat breakfast in Fayetteville because we didn't know how crowded it would be in Clarksville um, and we might not be able to get to eat. So we decided to get up at 645 and be at a restaurant in Fayetteville at 7 um, and then leave before, you know, as close to 8 as we could to get on the highway. So got up, went to a place called First Watch, which is a great breakfast place, and we had breakfast there in Fayetteville and um, decided to um, hop in the car, go down Highway 49, which I thought might be crowded. Uh, and then it eventually turned, you know, turned into I-40, at, which went east. And I figured that was going to be packed. And it was just had my fingers crossed that there wouldn't be 
so much traffic that it held us up from getting there in time. And, you know, this, again, this is eight in the morning, so we had tons of time, but with all of the warnings, you just never know. So uh, we left uh, Fayetteville with a full tank of gas, wanted to make sure we had gas, and um, we drove down 49, and it was like a normal day. I mean, I don't think there was really maybe 10% more traffic than would have been on a normal day from what I could tell. There was, it was not bumper to bumper. It did not look packed. Um, there was a lot of highway patrol out. Um, so we drove down 49, got to I-40, same thing at I-40. Uh, it just was not that crowded. There definitely was a lot more traffic heading towards the eclipse than there was leaving the eclipse, but just, it was not bumper to bumper. And so I was a little surprised and so we passed by Ozark, Arkansas, on I-40, where they were having events. But it was, again, it was only two and a half minutes of totality. And um, so we had decided to meet everybody in Clarksville. So we got to Clarksville. Let me see if I've got... Um, I don't remember exactly what time we got there. Let's see if we left Fayetteville at 8. I think we probably got there around 9.30. And um, I kind of expected when we pulled into town to see lots of cars, lots of tents, things going on. But um, as we pulled into Clarksville, it uh, was actually kind of dead. There just didn't seem to be a whole lot going on. I did not see a lot of extra cars. I didn't see any areas where people were camping out or things were going on. And so we pulled into a parking lot to kind of get our bearings and figure out if anything was going on in Clarksville. So Denise started doing some research um, to see what was going on. And uh, in the meantime, Joe texted me and asked if we had made it to Clarksville yet. And I told him yes. So he actually uh, was having breakfast with no problem, no crowd in Clarksville. And he met us in the parking lot where we all started talking. And Denise found out that there was actually... Um, Weather Channel and NASA and Telemundo and all kinds of people in Russellville. And there was a lot of events going on there. Uh, even an astronaut was there. And so I, I basically, because we were so early, uh, so, so we decided to drive around Clarksville a little bit and check it out. So we eventually made it to the downtown area and they had maybe six to eight vendors and maybe 10 people milling around. Not a lot of cars, not a lot of stuff going on. We drove by a stage that they had set up. There was really nobody there. Um, we made it out to their airport where it seemed like there was a little bit of traffic and they were having um, a group skydiving deal. So we got to see skydivers out there and there were tents on the grass but um, we asked some people there, and they acted like there was not an eclipse event going on at the airport. And so since we were already kind of on the outskirts of Clarksville, and it was only maybe 20 miles uh, further to Russellville, we all decided that due to the lack of just, I don't know, excitement or whatever. It just didn't seem like there was much going on in Clarksville. We decided to go ahead and drive over to Russellville. If the same thing was happening there, if we didn't like the situation there, we could always go back to Clarksville because we had so much time. So uh, we followed each other. Uh, Joe followed us, and we drove over to Russellville. And uh, we took the back highway, which was not I-40, but it kind of snaked along I-40. And so you could see the traffic over on I-40. So there was literally no traffic on the smaller highway we were on. And monitoring I-40, there was not uh, much traffic on there uh, other than just regular traffic. Uh, so we made it over to Clarksville, which was four and a half minutes of totality. And just as soon as we pulled in, uh, you could tell there was a whole different vibe going on over there. They had streets blocked off. There were hundreds and hundreds of people all gathered around doing stuff. They had vendors all over the downtown area. There was a stage set up with a NASA guy answering questions. There was you could find there was no place to park. We had to drive a couple of blocks away just to find a place to park. So we decided to get out and go check that out. There was also supposedly another area in Russellville in a soccer field that had a lot of stuff going on. So we were going to kind of check out the downtown area 
and possibly go check out the other area and decide, you know, what we wanted to do. But once we got to the um, downtown area of Russellville, um, we decided that, yeah, this was probably our place. They had um, a lot of the stores open. They had vendors. Uh, We actually grabbed a beer at a converted bank that they had turned into a bar so we had a got some beer there and had a toast a pre-eclipse toast uh, Denise bought a t-shirt you know they had like lots of stuff going on they had a NASA guy again uh, on stage answering questions and so it was just kind of a cool cool vibe there was one area set up by NASA where the astronaut was signing autographs that had tons of media um, Telemundo was there and some of the regional, uh, TV stations had a set set up and, um, everybody in this one grassy area had cameras and, uh, telescopes and all kinds of stuff. So we kind of liked the vibe that was going on there. So we basically uh, got all of our stuff out of the car and uh, headed over to that grassy area to see if there was a place, enough room that we could set up and everybody could sit down and, um, we were there early enough. Um, I believe that was um, around noon. Let me see. If, let me get all my bearings here. Um, so I think about noon we set up there in the grass and and got ready uh, to settle in for the eclipse. Let me see where I've got some notes here. So you can read you can read all this on the Curtis Tucker dot com blog. The astronaut was Mike Massimino. He was a veteran of two space flights, um, and he was there signing uh, autographs. And then NASA had like, I don't know, four or five or six tents set up, and there was this huge line, and people were getting free stuff and information. And they were passing out free eclipse glasses there. And so um, the sky, uh, one of the things, um, the sky was was totally blue, um, just a few wispy clouds that that just kind of drifted by, not thick, big clouds. I mean, even even the small little wispy cloud that would come by, you could still um, see the sun through it. So uh, the the we ended up next to a guy from Telemundo, and he was a um, meteorologist. So we got to talking to him. He said uh, it looked like the weather was going to be great. Uh, I mean, total blue sky, uh, heading towards 80 degrees, hot, um, just the perfect day to see an eclipse. And so we settled in on the grass. I set up my monopod and um, was texting with Staten down in Grapevine. They had gone, uh, they were getting some breaks in the weather down there. It was not raining. It was pretty cloudy, but uh, they went ahead and got their crew and went to a park. And basically it was those kind of thick, uh, clouds that would go by, but there would be spaces of blue, um, blue sunshine where you could actually see the sun. And so they ended up being able to see totality and the sun, um, at some point. So I, th- we definitely in Russellville had a way better, uh, visibility, but had we gone to Grapevine, um, we would not have missed out. We would have been able to see. So um, I was keeping in touch with him. Again, they had a pretty good uh, time down there. Uh, it did get up to about 80 degrees. Um, I was sweating. Uh, I think I got a little sunburn on the back of my neck. I had kept my hat on. Uh, uh, again, we kind of settled in around noon and then, uh, you know, it just started filling in. I don't know how many people ended up being in Russellville. I've got some video and some pictures I'll post, but, uh, in the area we were in, it, it got elbow to elbow. I mean, there was a lot of people crammed into that area, especially kind of around that stage. I think they had a screen where NASA had a plane that was following the eclipse and and you could see the video of that and they were kind of explaining um, all that that was going on. Uh, There was uh, people doing interviews all over the place, especially in our area, Telemundo. That guy kept going live and speaking in Spanish. He was from Miami and so he was uh, going live in Miami for their news uh, crews. But then there was uh, local Arkansas TV stations going live as well. So uh, by 1230, um, it was perfectly blue sky, no signs of clouds moving in. 
and around 1233, uh, you, people started talking about the, the uh, moon had started to touch the sun, so we put on our eclipse glasses, and sure enough, um, the eclipse had begun somewhere around 1233. And um, total uh, totality in our area was around two, no, one fifty. So we had just over an hour until totality. But man, about every ten minutes, you could tell that the temperature was dropping one or two degrees, and it it started feeling really, really nice. And then um, probably by one o'clock, I could kind you could kind of tell that the colors were starting to dull a little bit and there just wasn't the sharpness of everything in the shadows were we were starting to lose the crispness crispness of the shadows and then people started doing that deal where um, if you hold up like a piece of paper with a hole in it the uh, shadow will cast on something and there'll be like a little bite out of the sun so people were doing that so we knew that the uh, eclipse was progressing, and basically you could just kind of look up with your glasses on and, and see how it was going. Um, things seem to be getting, um, atmosphere-wise, just kind of calmer. It just kind of, everything just kind of started settling down. And uh, so I set up, I set up um, two iPhones and a GoPro on my monopod and had them running. I started them about 10 minutes before totality and then i had my other iphone with me and my um, 35 millimeter telephoto camera that i was going to take pictures of the moon with and so i got all that set up and again about 10 minutes before totality i turned all that on just to kind of film the crowd and just be able to capture that gradual darkness as it as it came in so what's really unusual is it seems like the darkness takes forever. You know, it's like it slowly, slowly, slowly creeps in. And then at that magical moment of totality, it all of a sudden gets really dark. And that's when everybody cheers and claps and screams and kisses and hugs and, and all that stuff. And so basically that happened about 1.50. Uh, they were making announcements up on the stage, I think, and got a, some people... Um, in anticipation, they, they cheered a little early. So there was kind of a multiple periods of cheering and clapping and, uh, boy, as soon as it went dark, uh, you know, we had at that point, we had four and a half minutes of darkness. I started snapping, um, some pictures and adjusting my, uh, camera so I could get the best pictures of the eclipse. But I noticed, um, you know, at totality, you can take off your glasses and look directly at the the sun, and you could, with the naked eye, you could see the little um, sun. Can't remember exactly what they call them. The, the kind of the 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 lava or plasma from the sun that kind of it kind of shoots out. It's not the it's not the actual sun rays themselves. It's just kind of the plasma on the sun. It kind of it sticks to the planet, but it, it, you could see those. Um, I don't remember seeing as many of those in 2017 as there were in 2024. And you can, I captured those on, on my camera. Um, so, uh, basically got that same, uh, in awe, this cosmic feeling of, of how cool it was that, you know, this moon was blocking out the sun and there was nothing we could do about it. There was nothing, um, you know, that we could do to prevent it. Um, and day turned into night, the streetlights came on, uh, the wind settled down, the temperature really dropped, uh, felt really, really nice. It was just, it, and, and when I say it, you, you have to experience totality, to understand the feeling, the experience, and the darkness, because looking up, it is nighttime. You can see stars. You can see just blackness. As you look down, you can kind of see a, a kind of a twilight look, 360 degrees all the way around you. It's kind of like it's sunset or just before sunrise, all the way around you, but from from the 
very from the ground, just a little bit up is where that, that kind of that twilight feeling is. But everything above that is just darkness. It's like, it's like full out nighttime. Um, and so because it was such, so 2017 was really cool because we had never experienced it. We were in a park. Um, there was fewer people, there was no buildings. And so we could experience the, the awe and, and the view of it. Whereas in Russellville, we had put ourselves in the middle of a pretty big crowd and in the downtown area where there was a lot of buildings. And so we didn't get the full darkness because the street lights and the building lights came on and the buildings were blocking kind of that twilight view. And then unfortunately the news station that had a set there, um, they decided to leave their lights on because they were, they were live on television and without the lights, you couldn't see them. And so I felt sorry for the people over next to them because they, they didn't get darkness because the stage had lights on. Um, it was kind of weird that they didn't at least turn them off for like at least a minute, but, um, got a lot of, uh, pictures with my camera and then I set it down, took a selfie with Denise with the iPhone. I did some extra video with my iPhone and then basically just stood there for a minute and just kind of soaked it in, looked around, watched the sun, tried to see if I could, you know, tell any of the, it just, it's, it's just kind of like the atmosphere just gets really, really serene and, and slow and calm. I guess, I guess it's calm, uh, even though the people are kind of frantic and screaming and yelling and, um, saying, look, look, you know, um, just the overall atmosphere is calm and cool. And so, um, I stopped taking pictures, was, uh, uh, taking a selfie with Denise. And then I started doing again, some filming, uh, with my iPhone and boy, I thought four and a half minutes was going to seem like a long time and it did not, it was quick. And then all of a sudden Denise, she knew. So, so when the sun, when the moon first gets over the sun at the very last second before it goes complete, it looks like a diamond ring. There's a, a, a kind of a ring around the moon and there's that last little blip of sunlight that disappears. And if you catch that, it looks like a diamond. So there's, there's two times during the eclipse that you can catch it. And that's when the moon first just at the last second covers the sun. And then the first, you know, half a second when the moon leaves covering the sun, you can get a ring there as well. And so because I didn't want to be looking at the moon when the sun was out, I didn't get the, and I didn't have a filter on my camera. I didn't get the diamond ring, you know, as the sun disappeared. So I wanted to be sure and get the diamond ring as the moon started to leave the sun. And Denise said, you better get your camera. And I thought, Oh man, is it time? And so I grabbed my camera and I pointed it up and I took one picture and then I took another picture, noticing that th this bright light, I mean, just this pin, little bright light. But as soon as that bright light came out, man, it was bright. Took another picture, and it was blurry. It had, because that light all of a sudden hit my camera lens, it blurred uh, my focus. And so um, luckily, within, you know, half a second or even less, it corrected and went back in focus, and I was able to snap another picture. And so looking at those pictures, um, I think I ended up taking three photographs right there within that time frame. And the, f the first one that I saw was the very last picture I took. And it was, it was a pretty good um, diamond ring picture, but it was a little bright. It was like I almost took it you know, half a second too late. Well, the picture that I think I wanted was the one that went blurry. It would have been probably the perfect shot, but it was blurry. But what I hadn't noticed until I got home was the picture right before the blurry picture was actually also a really great um, diamond ring. And it was maybe, you know, a tenth of a second too early, but still 
um, perfect timing. And so I ended up with two really great diamond ring uh, pictures of the eclipse and then just a lot of um, great pictures of the the plasma from the sun and just the whole um, eclipse deal. So so basically, and then within, you know, two, three seconds after that, there was a flood. So it, it's weird how going into the totality seems really slow. It's like darker, 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 dark, 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 dark. And then, and then, you see that last blip of sunlight and that's kind of when you, but it's already kind of dark at that point. Whereas it's completely opposite the other way. As soon as that first itty bitty amount of light comes from behind the moon, it just lights up everywhere. And then within two or three seconds, it's like you've gone from dark to light again. So it seems like daytime again, which it's, it's still really, kind of dark and hazy, but because of the difference between dark and light, it seems really light. And then it, it just seems like it slowly, not slowly, but it quickly, um, lightens up. Um, it seems, just seems like the, the light, light to dark is, is really quick on the end and really slow on the beginning. So, but anyway, so it was uh, basically over, um, you know, got really light, really quick and uh, there was not like a flood, a super flood of people just all of a sudden leaving, but we decided that um, just to try to beat the traffic, because at that point, I knew we were we had to eventually at some point get into traffic, and you could tell that there was thousands of people in Russellville. You could just see them. So we headed, uh, packed up, headed to the cars, um, told Joe goodbye. He was going to um, head to a different place. We decided... Probably the best thing to do was just to get on I-40 and drive back towards uh, Highway 49 and then back up to Fayetteville. Well, it was bumper to bumper and uh, not going really quick. I think we kind of figured we were averaging about 25 miles an hour. And basically, from from driving from Highway 49 to Russellville took us an hour longer going back to 49 than it did coming from 49. And so basically we got off of I-40, which would have was still bumper to bumper all the way into Oklahoma. So I'm guessing it was bumper to bumper at least, at least 90 miles, if not longer, probably longer, probably a lot longer, but, um, was a little surprised that 49 was bumper to bumper, for the first um, several miles of it, and then it started to kind of lighten up and spread out. And then the closer we got to Fayetteville, um, it was just kind of cruising, cruising along. So basically, we went back to Fayetteville, had dinner, um, picked up uh, the dog we'd met. My daughter had been in Enid with the dog, and so she brought the dog over to Fayetteville. We grabbed the dog and uh, headed back to Enid. And so got back a lot later than I had anticipated because of the traffic and driving all the way to Clarksville or to Russellville. Um, We basically got back to Enid after 10 p.m. And um, so that was kind of it. I, 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 and then I had so much, I had some catching up to do once I got here. So I didn't really get to think about it or contemplate what had happened until my morning walk the next day, which was on Tuesday. And so on that walk, um, you know, I kind of thought about what had happened. And, um, you know, again, it was a one of those core memory experiences that I'll never forget. Um, I, I have to say it wasn't as awe-inspiring or cool as my first one because the first one was the first one. And then I think this one we might have set up in too big of a crowd We probably should have found maybe an area that wasn't as crowded and then didn't have as many buildings. We probably should have been in like a field um, rather than in a downtown area. So, so kind of a tip for you guys there. Don't, you might not want to get stuck in a huge crowd in a downtown area. You're not going to get that 360 view of, of twilight towards the ground. Um, But I mean, I'm taking nothing away from the experience that we had. Four and a half minutes of totality was fantastic. It was cool. It was, it was a 
cosmic. It was it was like wow. So it was so wow that I I want to do it again. I want to um, go to the next one, which would be out of the country somewhere. Um, so we're looking at that. But the next official one that crosses the entire United States again is in 2045, and it basically takes the same path as the 2017 one, but 200 miles south, which puts it right over Enid, Oklahoma, where um, I am sitting right now. So basically my house, uh, August 12th, 2045, will be in totality uh, for five and a half minutes. So you don't even have to go, I think the center if you wanted to go closer to the center, which it's probably going to have to be like six minutes of totality, um, it's up by Nash, which isn't that far away, maybe a 30, 40 minute drive. Um, but I think, I think Enid's going to be like the perfect location to watch five and a half minutes of totality. You know, we've got all the benefits of a of a bigger town, but not being a huge town where traffic's going to be bad. We've got so many roads coming in and out of Enid. There's not going to be a traffic jam. So um, I am highly encouraging everybody to uh, come to Enid, Oklahoma for the eclipse. Um, Again, it's, it's 21 years away, but I, I, I think me and so many other people are excited about these eclipses now that what I want to do is have a 21-year build-up to 2045 in Enid. So I'm going to do some T-shirts and have people buy those and wear those for 21 years and then wear them to the eclipse um, in 21 years. I've started a website, so you can go to enideclipse.com. There's nothing... I don't have like updates or anything on there yet, but it is there. And then there's also a Enid Eclipse 2045 uh, Facebook page. And then I'm possibly thinking about doing a podcast. Now, again, we're so far out, but then also eventually I can see myself um, putting together a committee here in Enid to, you know, start ramping things up maybe 10 years um, or five years out, you know, getting... Um, you know, getting the city involved and other organizations, you know, there's no telling who's going to be around in 21 years. Um, but, you know, that is the plan right now. If for me, so there's two things that I encourage people to do uh, as far as all of this, and that's number one, go to totality once in your life. So if you're, I'm 61 now, and I'll be 82 at the 2045 eclipse, which I think is definitely doable, very easy to do. So if you're 61 or younger, 100% plan on being in the path of totality in 2045. No excuses. You've got time to plan for it. You've got time to raise the money for it, no matter where you are in the world, in the country. And, uh, and I kind of looking on the map, Enid is kind of right in the middle of the eclipse. It's going to go from California all the way to Florida, and Oklahoma is kind of right in the middle. And again, we are surrounded by, within two hours of of major cities with airports, we've got major roads coming into Enid. We are easy to get to from any part of the country because we're in the middle. And so um, my goal is to make Enid one of the uh, top five destinations for the eclipse in 2045. So continue to uh, check in on enideclipse.com. And I think you guys are going to really like the t-shirt. So I will have those up pretty soon. And what else do I have uh, going on? Um, I think that's about it. That's kind uh, kind of it. Let me... Oh, wow, this podcast has gone a lot longer than I thought, but I hope I didn't bore you with all of the details of getting there. So so this eclipse was so much different in the fact that there was so much planning and changing, and um, it just seemed like it was going on forever and ever, deciding where we're going to end up now. Everything turned out for the... I mean, couldn't have turned out any better. We ended up in the perfect location uh, saw the perfect amount of totality in the perfect weather, the perfect skies with a uh, great uh, group of people. Although we didn't, you know, connect with as many people as Todd and I had done in 2017, but in 2017, it was just he and I. 
and I was doing interviews in 2024. We had four of us, so we kind of stuck to ourselves, and and I didn't do any interviews. So um, two totally different experiences, but the same outcome, the same awe-inspiring um, outcome. So so I've seen two eclipses in totality. I will see three in uh, 2045. I highly recommend it for everybody. So that was what I was going to say. Um, number one, everybody should be in the path of totality. It is completely different than seeing an eclipse at 95 or 99%, um, just does not even compare. And I always talk about um, longevity, trying to live to be at a really older age. And, you know, so I highly recommend that people exercise and take care of themselves. But I also tell people to plan things, have something to look forward to. And that kind of keeps you motivated and gives you a reason to keep going. And so think about that. That's a 21 year reason to have something to look forward to. It's not going to be one of those deals like this eclipse. I've been really, really looking forward to for a year Although I knew I was going to come to it seven years ago, but you know, I, this this last year has just flown by. It's like wow, now I'm sitting here doing a podcast episode, and the eclipse is already over. And I had it on my calendar, and I for a year, and I've been looking at that date for a year, thinking I was going to Grapevine, and and now it's gone. So I don't want my life to flash before me, but. You know, I think 21 years is going to be here before we know it. So, um, so follow along, be a part of this adventure for me. It's going to be a 21 year adventure. At the end of 2045, I think um, I'll be done eclipse chasing. Maybe, maybe not, um, but probably just because there um, won't be an eclipse, you know, soon enough for me to to get to. So. Um, I think it's going to be fun. Um, a lot of different ideas. You know, what I'll probably do is every August 12th for the next 21 years, I will go out and I will film what the sky and the weather looks like on that date every, way, every day, every year for 21 years. And then um, we'll have, we'll, we'll know, you know, what the weather potential is going to be on that date, which I think is going to be sunny and clear. Um, we don't get a whole lot of uh, thunderstorms and stuff. The only thing we would have would be big puffy clouds um, in August uh, here in Oklahoma. So I think the weather, I would guess, is going to be great. But anyway, we'll know because I will monitor monitor it for the next 21 years. Um, the t-shirt's going to be fun because it's something that you're going to be able to wear and people can read it and say, oh, wow, you're going to go to the uh, 2020, 2045 eclipse and it can start up a conversation for 21 years rather than wearing the T-shirt after the event. This is going to be wearing the T-shirt before the event and then actually wearing the T-shirt to the event. And I might even update, have a different design every year until 2045, which would mean... Um, 21 different designs. So you guys get ready for that. I've got a whole bunch of other ideas um, as far as that. But anyway, I appreciate you guys checking in on the podcast. Please send me an email. Just send it to curtis at curtistucker.com. Don't forget uh, that this is also a blog post and a video. If you're watching the video or reading the blog post, it's also a podcast. So I, I appreciate you guys. Please subscribe to the podcast. Tell your friends. And uh, you guys have a great day, and I'll talk to you soon. See you.